Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode. In this video and the videos I'm hoping to make in the future, I want to explore the civilizations, concepts, and ideas that have gone into making the Western world or Western civilization what it is today. And in this first video, I really want to deal with what I consider to be the foundational culture of Western civilization, which is the Greeks. The reason why I feel this is so important is that the ideas of Western, Western civilization are under constant attack. And it's due to a reason that is quite common, which, which I kind of call the vaccine effect, in that Western civilization has, and the concepts that made it great have been so successful that bad ideas are able to grow and then potentially undermine the entire foundation. And we see this with vaccines. So the reason why people can delude themselves into thinking they don't need vaccines is are because vaccines have worked so well. You luckily have never had a family member who had to deal with a whooping cough or a family member who's been raised in an iron lung. And that's because the vaccines that have been invented have worked amazingly well. And that's why you can delude yourself into the, the stupidity that you know bee pollen or some kind of homeopathic method are just as good as vaccines. You never had to deal with the horrors of a vaccine-free world, so you can delude yourself with that kind of nonsense. Now, in my mind, one of the biggest lies out there are that all cultures and civilizations are the same. And it's this kind of cultural and moral relativism that you see in all civilizations as they near their end. But this is demonstrably not true. And, and even people who say things like that by their actions prove that it, it is not true. So for example, is it better to be an atheist in Utah or Saudi Arabia? Pretty obvious, if you're an atheist in Saudi Arabia, um, you're not likely to be killed. Same thing with being gay. Is it better to be gay in a Western society, a Western city like San Francisco or Iran? Well, in Iran, you're going to be thrown off a roof of a building in all likelihood. Would you rather drink the water in San Diego or Tijuana? Those cities are relatively close to each other, but they're governed by very different philosophies. And the differences are profound. I mean, I'm not even going to, that's obvious where you'd rather drink the water. Now, which societies are the most dynamic? Western societies? Or societies that at least follow the Western way? Or non-Western societies? Such as the Islamic world for the most part. Which societies do people attempt to immigrate to? People pour across the border um, from Mexico trying to get into the, into the United States, but people don't pour across the border from Canada, even though it's obviously much colder in Canada and the weather is much more in, inhospitable. Why is that? Canada is a Western country with Western ideals and Mexico is not, and the results are there for all to see. So very clearly, the West is the best, and it needs to be said loud, and it needs to be said proudly. But, like I said before, the Western tradition is like a house, and we are right now occupying the highest level of that house. But it's the Greeks who laid the foundation for it. It is important to, to, that we understand this foundation, the gifts that the Greeks gave us, so that we can protect it and celebrate it. And defend it from its detractors. It is very important to defend the foundation from specious reasoning. For just like a house, if the foundation of that house fails, the entire building will collapse. And history can be quite brutal in this regard to, to civilizations that lose their foundations. And this is where kind of the famous maxim comes from that civilizations die of suicide, not murder. And I'm going to give some examples of this towards the end of the video, just to show you how true that is. But let's start now with the Greeks themselves. What exactly are the gifts of the Greeks? What do we owe them? And what does Western civilization owe them? 
Well, their greatest gift, in my opinion, is what I would call a critical consciousness, which is the idea that everything is up for debate. And this is actually where we get the scientific method in that it is okay to collect data and come to a conclusion, even if it is controversial. Um, for example, um, back in the day, the Greeks had many great medical writings from Egypt, but those writings would often blame things on demons and the occult. The ancient Greeks would look at it and try to base their conclusions on the observable world. And this is, in fact, where we get the root, root where we get the word physician from. The root word is physis, which means Greek for nature. Another important concept we can thank the ancient Greeks for is the idea of is the idea of individual rights. Now, the Greeks have a, a word called polis, and it really has two meanings. Polis refers to self-governing cities that the Greeks would set up, but it also refers to individual citizens who had rights as well as responsibilities. And this is a radical concept. So for example, in ancient Greece, men would keep fit in the gymnasia in order to prepare for an event of war because it was their responsibility to defend the polis. And side note, this is obviously where we get the root word for gym. But if men are going to voluntarily fight, they're going to want to have a say in how they are governed. And that's exactly what happened in ancient Greece. So in ancient Greece, we got the beginnings of what we would call democracy. And in ancient Greece, for example, all offices, except those requiring special knowledge, were filled by lottery. And generals is an example of a skill set that's very particular, but everything else could be filled by any citizen. So bottom line is that every citizen would serve the polis in some important capacity. And I just want to stress again that this idea that the citizen takes action himself. He's not merely a serf who takes orders from above, from a king or from some kind of emperor. The idea of modern citizens, modern citizenship, we owe to the Greeks. Polis is obviously where we get the root word for politics, as well as um, democracy as well, it's also a Greek word. And it's very important to note here that there's no Persian, Asian, or Arab equivalent for the word democracy. That's why they all use the Greek word. This idea did not come from their civilizations. It came from ancient Greece. This is why even today, that if you're looking for a rational system of government founded on liberty, people will look to ancient Athens and not to Peking. Another gift that the Greeks gave us was again this idea of citizen or being a citizen or citizenship. In that the idea is that anybody could become a Greek citizen. Um, Isocrates um, believed that being Hellene doesn't mean speaking Greek. Rather, it's what you have in your mind, in your heart, and your spirit that matters. This is a radical concept because most of the world, most of the non-Western world, even today, is ruled by a form of tribalism, which in the Western world is the poison of identity politics. But where you don't see yourself as a citizen, but you identify first with your group, whether it be by race, by class, by caste, or by culture. It's with the Greeks that the, first, the idea first came out that anybody could become a Greek. So in the modern world, you know, anyone could become American. But at the same time, if you go to live in China for a long time, you will never be considered fully Chinese. Or same thing with a culture like Japan. You can live in Japan for three generations, but if you're not, not born as an ethnic Japanese person, you will never be considered uh, and a, a pure Japanese or a Japanese citizen. 
Another gift from the Greeks is the idea of private property in the free market. What the Greeks did was they kind of promoted the idea that you could buy and sell goods and services free of government coercion. Another big idea that we get is civilian control of the military. Now, you may not like you know, any particular American president, whether it's Trump or Obama or either of the Bushes, but one thing you don't have to put up with is our leaders dressing like in paramilitary garb like Castro or Saddam Hussein and using the military to govern. It is civilian control of the military in Western countries. And that, again, is a radical concept that we can trace back to ancient Greece. Another idea is that of religious tolerance in that in ancient Greece, you could worship whoever you wanted. And that is a very much a Western idea. Again, like I said in the beginning, try and open a Christian church in anywhere in the Islamic world and see how far you get. And yet we allow mosques to be open in the Western world as part of religious tolerance. History and political science we owe to the Greeks. In particular, the Greek Herodotus journeyed through Asia Minor and Egypt and recorded everything he could. And this is where we get the idea of history and political science. Comedy, drama, and epics were all, or we can all thank ancient Greece for. And this also goes back to the whole idea of the critical consciousness and that only a society that accepts self-criticism can have comedies and drama and epics. Because often the most contentious ideas of that time were first debated in comedy and in the Greek comedies, dramas and plays. So if you have any doubt as to how important ancient Greece is to the modern Western world, just consider some of the words that derive from ancient Greece. These include philosophy, history, logic, physics, criticism, rhetoric, dialogue, tragedy, comedy, epic, aesthetics, analysis, and democracy. Basically, it would be impossible to have the modern world without these concepts. And all of these concepts can be traced right back to ancient Greece. Now, there are critics of the Greeks, and I just want to deal with them briefly. The most obvious one is criticism of the Greeks by the left. And what they typically do is judge the Greeks by modern standards and try to diminish them by it. So, for example, they will say women couldn't vote or slavery existed in ancient Greece, therefore we should just dis dismiss all of their accomplishments. My reply to that, though, is always compared to what? What civilization in ancient times did a better job on, on, on those concepts than, than the Greeks did? You're not going to find it in Africa, you're not going to find it in Asia. It simply doesn't exist. But what's more, again, we come back to this idea of the critical consciousness. In the Western tradition, they were aware of, and they would question whether slavery was good or bad, or whether women should vote. And although they never quite got there, the Western tradition of self-analysis was always present. So, for example, in many of their plays, like I mentioned before, would feature strong and smart women sort of running circles around the men of the time. Likewise, the morality of slavery was debated even back then. But what is more critical, though, is that the heirs to ancient Greece are the ones who eventually put an end to slavery. So, oh, and also gave women the right to vote. It's Western countries that did this. Um, no, it wasn't Japan. It wasn't it's not Saudi Arabia. Oh, so for example, it was the British Empire and led by the Royal Navy that largely wiped out the Atlantic slave trade. And this was really spearheaded by a man that too many people have forgotten by the name of William Wilberforce. And I think I'm going to do a video just on him. And of course, in the American Civil War, that largely settled the question of slavery right there. 
Another attempt to diminish the accomplishments of the ancient Greece, Greeks come from a group of people I call the geographic determinists. And the most prominent of these is the author Jared Diamond, who was the author of the book Guns, Germs, and Steel, as well as many others. In his view, or in this view, Greeks were nothing special, and they were merely products of their environment. If it hadn't been the ancient Greeks, if somebody else had been there, the same things would have happened. But what he fails to explain then is why other environments, which are actually much more favorable than what the ancient Greeks were working with, fail to, fail to even come close to their accomplishments. So you can find similar or better climates in China, in India, in the Persian Gulf, or in Spain for that matter. And it just didn't happen. Being Greek, and what the Greeks accomplished was from, from a way of thinking from a belief in their own civilization and their own knowledge. It wasn't didn't have really anything to do with the geographics or the geographic environment they were given. As an example of this, um, at one point Egypt basically collapsed and what happened was the Nile started silting up, growing crops were becoming much more difficult and the crop yields were falling and as a result Egyptian culture started to kind of seize up and in Jared Diamond's view that's to be expected and Egypt is just going to fail at that point but luckily for ancient Egypt Alexander the Great invaded and he as well as the, the Greeks that followed him ruled Egypt for a time and once again they kind of put the Greek way of looking at the world to work and they question things like farming methods crop rotation, and the kind of the crops you're, you're planting, etc. And quite quickly, Egypt was restored and had record uh, wheat output. And Sir Diamonds has no, if you believe him and his determinist model, this just shouldn't happen. But it did happen because of the knowledge and the wisdom of the ancient Greeks. Now, civilizations, as I said earlier, die of suicide not murder. What makes the West great also contains the seeds of its own destruction if we let it. And like I say, all of the great ideas of Western civilization, free expression, analysis, debate, um, allow much more spurious ideas um, to f flourish as well. And in the modern context, that is postmodernism and, and the moral and cultural relativism that we see today. So in my mind, Western civilization is almost like this beautiful garden, but it's so successful that weeds can, can grow in it as well, and it can really take root if we let it. I've already mentioned moral and cultural relativism, but actually I made a video specifically on postmodernism, which is really just warmed over Marxism. And I'll provide a link to that below, and it's definitely worth checking out if you want to understand how noxious this philosophy is. Because the problem is, is when people start to get lazy and start embracing these false ideas, it creates self-doubt within a society. And you begin to wonder if your society is, is worthy and is it worthy of continuing. And if that gets to be a commonly held thought in society, History can be brutal in how it treats those societies. Basically, if you no longer believe your civilization is good and worth defending, um, history will wipe you out very quickly. And this is what actually happened to the Greeks. When Greeks were kind of at their height, when they believed in themselves, they were able to hold the mighty Persian Empire at bay. But when these sort of the same sort of doubt started creeping in, and you see the same thing all the time, a much smaller force is what eventually conquered them. Same thing goes for the Romans. When Rome was at its height, there were always barbarians along the borders of ancient Rome. I mean, there's, there's always barbarians on the, on the edge, edges of any culture. But when, when Roman self-belief was, was strong, they were able to hold them off very easily. When Rome started to collapse on itself, when it started experiencing self-doubts, when people started questioning what it meant to be Roman, or whether there was any value in it, 
the barbarians were able to invade, and they literally went down the, the very roads that the Romans had built in the first place. A more modern example of this is actually the fall of France during World War II. France is obviously a Western country, but what happened to France is between World War I and World War II, the educational establishment really wanted to downplay nationalism or pride in France because it was their view that that led to World War I and the horrors of it. So they downplayed the value of French society, that all civilizations were the same, that there were victims on both sides in World War I, they ceased to celebrate the heroic defenders of France in World War I, and they did their job very well. But what happens though is, again, French, the French no longer believed in their civilization anymore. And so when they were invaded, the national will collapsed within six weeks. When a society or a civilization stops believing in itself, history is just brutal. And I actually made another a video on this as well, which I will link to below. So the bottom line is, if you believe in individual rights, self-critique, constitutional government, free markets, secular government, and religious tolerance, Greece matters. But what do you think? Do you agree with me that, that Greek civilization is important? That Western civilization is important? Is it worth defending? Why or why not? And if you're in school, I'm actually very curious as to what you're being taught because I'm, I'm reading these horrible things about people trying to get rid of Western civilization as a, as a topic, which is actually why I started making these videos. So please leave your comments below, and thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.